Hi there, I'm Dr. Lauren Mathewson, and I'm going to be discussing mistletoe for cancer support with you. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I work at Revolutions Naturopathic. We have locations both in Folsom and Roseville, California. So right off the bat, I want to make sure that I'm very clear that the use of mistletoe in cancer is only as an adjunctive therapy. That Mistletoe should never be considered standalone cancer therapy. Um, this is an educational presentation about the potential uses of mistletoe, but please make sure that you're consulting with a trained healthcare provider before starting any new protocols or medications. So the history of mistletoe. Mistletoe, as you know, it, um, it's a plant that grows in trees. It grows off of the tree. So it's a, considered a saprophytic plant. Um, and, and up here in Northern California, we have this and our tree is all over. So um, it's just a really beautiful, interesting plant that again, you know, we as humans have been using mistletoe therapeutically for millennia. Mistletoe, interestingly, is the most studied and the most widely used integrative cancer supportive botanical. There are thousands and thousands of published journal articles about using mistletoe. It's very, very safe. It's been well documented. Um, you know, in Europe, mistletoe is pretty much uh, the standard of care if you've been diagnosed with cancer. It's the standard of care alongside the other therapies that are being recommended. So um, there are estimates that anywhere between 70 and 85% of Europeans are using mistletoe um, in addition to doing their chemotherapy and in addition to doing their radiation. Um, so it's it's something that is being very broadly used there. And here in the United States, it just hasn't really picked up as much momentum as, um, as use in the Northern European countries. Um, there are studies going on in the United States right now. 2017, Johns Hopkins launched a phase one clinical trial. And um, that clinical trial is wrapping up right now. Uh, it was so successful that plans for phase two and phase three trials have been fast tracked. So that's generally a good sign when, um, when not only when we finish one phase, but we go into phase two and three, it means that there weren't adverse reactions in phase one, but there was enough benefit that um, it's worth further investigation. So why mistletoe? Um, you know, this is just sort of an overview in terms of why we would use this, why I use it with oncology patients. Um, again, I, we have so many studies showing that when patients use mistletoe, they experience a, a real decrease of their negative side effects of, um, from their conventional therapies. Um, so that would be something like, you know, if a patient's going through chemotherapy or radiation, um, we would hope that using mistletoe would, would provide that patient with a little more stamina, that they would be less fatigued, that they would have a better appetite. I certainly am always looking for things that improve quality of life for my patients and mistletoe is very high on my list of things that I think about when I need an improvement to quality of life. Um, additionally, when patients are using mistletoe alongside their conventional treatments, uh, we're seeing that they're experiencing less leukopenia, less anemia. So certainly things like radiation and chemotherapy are, are very well known to kind of knock down some of the red and white blood cell populations in the patients that are receiving those therapies. And that is a side effect, a known side effect of those medications. Well, it's important that we have enough red, white, and red and white blood cells. In particular, you know, our, our white blood cells are our immune fighters. So it's always this sort of juggling act where we're administering chemotherapies, um, but we need to keep white and red blood cells high enough that the patient can keep receiving those therapies. So mistletoe is a really nice, gentle way to kind of sustain those cell populations so that we're seeing less interruption to chemotherapy and radiation programs. We're also just seeing patients feel better. Um, I see less nausea and vomiting in my patients that are using mistletoe, less pain and including 
pain from their treatment or pain from their tumors. We also see increased survival in folks that are using these treatments. And that very well could be because if they're able to tolerate the full course of their treatment, they have better um, success outcomes on the other side. We're also seeing some evidence of um, liver protection, less hepatotoxicity from chemotherapies and the other treatment protocols when using Viscum. What does Viscum do for the immune system specifically? So mistletoe has lectins in it and lectins are just plant fragments, but lectins can really um, kind of send a powerful message to your body. And in particular, when used, um, when we're using mistletoe lectins, we're using them as an immune modulator. So what I'm looking for is I want the my patient's natural killer cell populations to stay robust. I want their CD8 cytotoxic T cells to stay robust. Those are the cells that go out and scavenge and they look around for dead, dying, damaged cells that have gotten loose. And that includes cancer cells. Um, mistletoe helps maintain dendritic cells and those cells are very important to your immune system and that also helps maintain appropriate cytokine activity. Cytokines are chemical messengers that your body sends out that may say like, oh, we need some inflammation in this area or um, we need to, you know, ramp up our immune capabilities. Mistletoe also stabilizes and repairs DNA and RNA. Um, in particular, it protects DNA from radiation damage. Um, so I have a lot of patients who are concerned. They're being recommended radiation therapy, say after they've had a mastectomy or after they've had a lump removed, and they're concerned that going through a course of radiation is gonna do more damage to their system. So it's really lovely when we're able to come in and say, yeah, you know, it's important that you do this radiation and let's, we've got these tools that can help protect your healthy cells from damage to that radiation. So a lot of times that gives people a little bit of peace of mind and, um, you know, and we're just seeing improved health outcomes with that. Um, mistletoe is also anti-inflammatory and like I mentioned earlier, it helps modulate pain. It lowers VEGF, which is a um, chemical messenger that induces angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the development of new blood vessels that feed tumors. So we don't want angiogenesis in terms of a cancer setting. So if we're able to kind of lower some of these cell signaling messengers that would contribute to that, it's fantastic. And like I already mentioned, the mistletoe um, stimulates bone marrow to produce healthy populations of the new red and white blood cells. There are sources of mistletoe. Um, they're interestingly all the same species. They're all Viscum um, album. The strain of mistletoe is dependent on which host tree that mistletoe plant grew on. And I just think that is really a beautiful way to think about things. So the, the host trees that we use the most are apple, pine, and fir trees. They all have slightly different effects and they're appropriate for slightly different cancers. Here's an example of how we select the different types of mistletoe. And again, you're definitely going to want to go through this um, sort of selection with your um, healthcare provider. But in general, you know, we kind of say the M series is for female cancers. A series is great for use with chemotherapy or for patients who are a little bit more fragile or a little more frail. We use the P series for some of the liquid type cancers like the lymphomas and leukemias. Um, so again, this is you would make this decision which type was most appropriate with you with your healthcare provider, but um, just to kind of demonstrate that there are some different strains of mistletoe, um, again, based on their host tree. So we've got a few different ways to use mistletoe. There's the oral uh, application, there's subcutaneous injections, and there's IV therapy. The subcutaneous injections happen up to three times a week and those injections are into the tissue of the abdomen. What we're looking for is a little mild skin rash. It's also sometimes called a blush 
at that injection site, and sometimes it'll take 24, 48 hours for that rash to show up, but I'm looking for a rash that's about the size of a quarter, right? I don't want a really big, robust rash. I want something that just tells me that I've got the attention of your immune system. Um, it's so interesting, kind of once we find the dose that your body is going to react to, we stop our dose escalation and we stay at that dose until you're no longer reacting. So this is definitely one of those therapies that is so very individualized to the patient. Um, and then that dose escalation when we decide to step up next is really driven by your body's response and tolerance. I will mention that eventually everyone stops reacting with that little skin blush to the injections, but that can take a, it can take a while before we see that lack of reaction. It doesn't mean that the therapy is not still having benefit. It just means that, um, you know, your body isn't mounting that skin reaction anymore. IV mistletoe is also an option. We can do IV mistletoe with any of the three different types of IV or of the mistletoe um, strains. IV mistletoe follows a dose escalation on a pretty set schedule. You start low and slow and you build up dose as you go along. This is really nice support for patients who are experiencing or need relief from tumor pain, if their chemo side effects are dramatic, or if they're having rapidly progressing disease, then that would be a time where we would sit down and discuss, is it time to shift over to IV mistletoe? With IV mistletoe, I would expect to see a slight increase in the patient's temperature during IV administration. So I'm looking for about one degree of change from when we start the IV until the end of the IV. Um, I've also heard back from patients that they may feel a little warm or slightly feverish that evening. I like that. That is, to me, that is a side effect I'm looking for from the mistletoe. As long as the fever doesn't go too high and it's just a little mild fever, um, that tells me that we're having a good therapeutic response to that dose. There are contraindications for using mistletoe. So this isn't a therapy that is just across the board recommended for everyone. Obviously, if you have a fever, I don't want to make your fever worse. So I would withhold giving mistletoe to anyone who had an active fever. Autoimmune diseases can be made worse with mistletoe because mistletoe is cranking up the immune system. It's that immune modulator that's kind of getting your immune cells really paying attention. Autoimmune disease, sometimes we don't want immune cells extra paying attention. We want them, if anything, kind of calming down. So, um, and in particular, hyperthyroid autoimmune disease, I would not be a good option to use mistletoe with. Things like tuberculosis, biliary stenosis, those aren't going to be good options for folks. Um, and then pregnancy and breastfeeding, we just don't have enough data to say that it's safe to use mistletoe through um, pregnancy and breastfeeding. So I would ask patients to please not. And then any sort of liver, heart, kidney failure, um, IV therapy and IV mistletoe will be contraindicated in those circumstances. For more information about mistletoe therapy, if you or you know anyone who thinks that this might be a therapy that could provide you with additional benefit, please don't hesitate to reach out to our office. We schedule a free 15 minute consultations. It's a chance for patients to see if we're gonna be a good fit and to kind of learn a little bit more about us. You can always contact us through our front office at 916-351-9355. Thanks so much.